In the first chapter of Acts, it tells us that it began with about a, with 120 believers. And then in chapter 2, 3,000 were saved. And then in Acts 3, the apostles healed a man who had been lame from birth. And now, uh, on this day when he was healed, he was 40 years old. Everybody knew the man. He hung out there by the synagogue, by the gate, I should say. And they had all uh, seen him, that he had been unable to walk for four decades. They knew he wasn't faking it. And now all of a sudden, he was healed. <laughs> this lame man, who everyone knew is jumping up and down, he's walking around, he's full of joy, he's so happy, and everyone uh, kind of gathered around the apostles and where he was. And the apostles took this opportunity to address the crowd. And right in the middle of their teaching, they were interrupted by several religious leaders. They formed a mob, and, and the, these were some of the same religious leaders who plotted to have Jesus crucified. And here they are now popping up again. So we, we pick up the story in Acts chapter 4, verse, verse 1, all the way to verse 4, and then we'll, we'll continue on in a bit. But Acts 4, verse 1 says, And as they were speaking to the people, the priests and the captain of the temple and the Sadducees came upon them, greatly annoyed because they were teaching the people and proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection from the dead. And they arrested them and put them in custody until the next day, for it was already evening, and many of those who heard the word believed, and the number of men came to about 5,000. The Sadducees wanted to shut Peter and John up, but it was too late. Peter and John may have been behind bars. It may have looked like the enemy had won, but the gospel message had already gone out. The disciples were confined to a cell, and it says, but the good news was already spreading. The officials arrested the apostles, but they could not arrest the power of God at work. And you start to see this pattern develop that the more pressure that was put on the church, the bigger the growth that God blessed them with. And did you get that? The more the pressure, the greater the growth. When God's children do all the right things, don't be surprised when trouble comes anyway. Too often, Christians get confused and think that if you really walk with God, then everything's going to be smooth sailing the rest of the way. But we can't forget that we live in a broken world filled with broken people. We are not immune from pain and problems. Stuff's going to happen. Stuff's going to happen to us. Uh, people sometimes will lie to us. Uh, they might deceive and try to cheat us. You, you, you live in the world long enough and it doesn't take long to, to be disappointed, and to get stressed, to start to feel anxious and fearful about stuff. Some people will try to manipulate us and take advantage of us. Others will try to control us. Uh, some folks never apologize. Uh, they might blame you for something you didn't do. They might take delight in your failure. Those are things that some people might do to us. And then other times, there's stuff we do to ourselves, right? There, there are old patterns of thinking that can drag us down. Uh, we might keep falling into the same traps. It's hard when you, you want to do things differently and you just keep doing the same thing over and over like this endless loop that just keeps repeating itself. <sighs> we all make mistakes. Failures can teach us valuable lessons. But just because we fail doesn't guarantee that we'll learn our lesson. That's why we don't just read the Bible for entertainment or because it has uh, great stories. Uh, we don't read it like we read other books. No, we study the scriptures to understand who God is and who we are in him. We, we look at the Bible to gain wisdom, to learn how to make better choices, to grow in strength and fortitude. And, and that's why we, we are, we're all here right now learning. 
Uh, that's why we sing and worship to our God. And all of those thoughts, all of those ideas, all uh, ex explain to us in different forms who God is and who we are in him. Uh, they remind us of who he is and who we are. And we might fall from time to time, but that's not us anymore. As children of the Most High God, we have been given a new nature. The Holy Spirit of God has now taken up residence inside of our souls. And that changes our entire way of being from the inside out. It's kind of like the old example that, that people have used between uh, the difference between pigs and sheep. <laughs> when you put a pig in a pig pen, the pig can adapt quite well. Pigs can thrive just fine in the mud. Uh, that's what pigs too, do, right? Uh, they, can, they can live with the, with the mud caked all over them. And when it rains, uh, you know, it can wash it all away. And they clean up pretty well. And they're kind of cute, cute, right? But then they just, if you leave them in there, they'll just wallow in the mud all over again. Uh, because uh, it, it, it fits them well. But when sheep fall into the mud, they, they can't stand it. Uh, because somehow they know instinctively that that's not where they belong. Uh, their wool, if their wool gets muddy, it, it can lead to bacterial infections. Uh, they, you, might, you might trap them in a dirty pig pen, but they won't be happy. They will bleat, they will scream, they will cry uh, until you get them out. Because sheep were not made for mud. And as children of God, we can make... We can be a lot like sheep. Uh, sometimes we act like we used to. We might start to talk like we once did and think old thoughts. We might not want to forgive that person who hurt us. We might get bitter about some stuff at times. But the reality is that for every follower, follower of Christ, we have a new nature. And so when we do fall into the mud of our own sin, we're not happy about it. Our hearts are grieved. We feel convicted. We, our conscience feel, feels guilty. Um, 1 John 3, 9 says, No one born of God makes a practice of sinning, for God's seed abides in him. And he cannot keep on sinning. Because he has been born of God. So that doesn't mean we're perfect, right? Uh, we all get tripped up at times. But because we have a new nature, we, we aren't comfortable with the mud anymore. Uh, instead of looking for sin like we used to, now we, we want to avoid it. Um, and so don't be surprised when we do uh, fall that... Don't be surprised when the devil comes and points his finger and says, see, it's still the same, old you. Look at you covered in mud like that. Uh, you're, you say you're different, but nothing has changed. Oh, don't, don't believe that. He is the accuser of the brethren. Uh, listen, you might be covered in mud at times. Sometimes you might even be unrecognizable. But... You don't belong there. That's not you anymore. Now don't believe the lies. Listen for God's voice. He, he's calling your name. He seeks the lost sheep out. Um, Max Lucado tells a, uh, a story that happened in November of 2008. A 65-year-old man named Jim O'Neill was plotting, uh, piloting, I should say, his little airplane from Scotland to England and then all of a sudden, he lost his sight. And at first, he thought he'd been blinded by the sun. But soon, he realized that it was much worse than that. He'd suffered a stroke, and he couldn't see any longer while flying an airplane. And he remained calm as he groped for the radio to ask for help. And the air traffic controllers immediately contacted a man named Paul Gerard, who, had been a, who was in the Royal Air Force wing commander and was flying nearby. Uh, Mr. Gerard went to where Mr. O'Neill was, and he flew his plane one over the other. And from there, he told the blinded pilot exactly what to do. 
His instructions were simple. A gentle right turn, a left a little bit, right a little bit, down, now up. They tried landing eight times before he was finally able to help the blind pilot touch down safely. Lucado writes, and I quote, can you empathize with O'Neill? Most can. We've been, we've been struck, perhaps not with a stroke, but with a divorce, a sick child, or a cancer-ridden body. Not mid-air, but mid-career, mid-semester, mid-life. We've lost sight of any landing strip and in desperation issued our share of Mayday prayers. We all know the fear of flying blind. Unlike O'Neill, however, we can hear more than one voice. Many voices besiege our cockpit, you might say. The talk show host urges us uh, to worry. The new age guru says to relax. Uh, the financial page forecasts a downturn. The pastor says pray. The professor says fooey. So many opinions. Uh, lose weight. Eat low fat. Join our church. Try our crystals. It's enough to make you cover your ears and run. What if you follow the wrong voice? Who will you put your faith in as you, as you go through life? Whose guidance will you follow? What voice do you listen to? End quote. No matter, listen, no matter where we find ourselves, God is always at work around us. He will never leave us, he'll never forsake us, and he'll never stop giving us insight and direction. And he says, if you lack wisdom, just ask and I'll freely give it. And so whether you find yourself up in the sky or, and scared or whether you're down on the ground safe and sound, he has the power to provide everything you need for every day, for every moment, every problem, every pain, every trouble that you face. And that's what was happening um, to, to Peter and John. They had landed in jail uh, and the next day they were put on trial. And they were being questioned by these authorities. Uh, and they wanted to know how. How did Peter and John, how were they able to heal this lame man? The two apostles ex explain that it wasn't them, but they did it by the power of Jesus. The same Jesus, they said, whom they crucified. And then God raised him from the dead. And look at how this unfolded in verses, uh, Acts 4, verses 12 through 14. It says, uh, as they're uh, communicating to the, uh, to the officials, they're on trial. They said, there is, speaking of Jesus, there is salvation in no one else. For there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Now, when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were uneducated, common men, they were astonished and they recognized that they had been with Jesus. But seeing the man who was healed standing beside them, they had nothing to say in opposition. The Sanhedrin were so, and these religious leaders were so impressed with the courage and passion of Peter and John. And remember, this is the same Peter who denied Jesus three times after Jesus was arrested. Uh, when a lowly servant girl recognized Peter, he cowered and he ran, crying. He was afraid of being arrested. And now fast forward seven weeks, and now here is Peter preaching. He isn't afraid to be arrested or what they'll say. Before, he lacked courage, and now God gave him boldness. Uh, in the end of the trial, they did not have anything to hold Peter and John on. Uh, before they let the two apostles go, uh, the religious leaders threatened them to quit, quit preaching about Jesus. They didn't stop. Uh, they went out, and they gathered again, boldly because you know sometimes as it says in Acts 529 you must obey God rather than men 
And in just seven weeks, everything had changed. Jesus died and rose again. The Holy Spirit came and filled them up. And that's why these powerful men could tell that these simple common men uh, were just like so average looking, but they recognized that they had been with Jesus. Uh, we had this happen with one of the students we hosted. We, we host students from the university up to, uh, up to 20 at a time. And so at the beginning of each semester might have you know 20 or 30 or 40, sometimes 50 flow through at, at the beginning of a semester. But most of them are graduate students from the other side of the world and almost all of them are of other religions. And in some cases, we're the first Christians that they have ever met. And in many cases, uh, this is the first Christian home that they've ever been inside of. And at the house, we have uh, Bible verses like in frames all over the house. And sometimes they'll say to us like, we really enjoy those sayings on the wall. They don't know that they come from scripture, right? Um, but we had one particular student who was very, a few semesters back, who, who was very perceptive. He kept saying over and over uh, to us, he kept saying, there's something uh, I, different here. I, I don't understand it. I've never sensed anything like this. Uh, he and his friends came here with us where we gathered to record these messages here in Corpus Christi, Texas. And he met the other folks who gather here with us and uh, he walked away saying, as soon as we walked out, he said, you know, I'm very devoted to my religion. And I know my brothers back home would not be happy that I've, I'm coming here. He said, but I've never sensed anything like what I'm sensing right now. I don't know what it is. I don't know how to put my finger on it. That is Jesus at work in his heart. Uh, he perceived, he recognized something. He was sensing at the house with us and here at the church with other believers is that these people have been with Jesus. There's a certain spirit about them. There's a, a certain love emanating from their souls. But, but we can't forget in the midst of all of our problems and all whatever we're going through in struggles and trials, we can't forget what we are here for. It's so easy for Christians to look like the people on our social media. Uh, it's easy to look uh, more like our favorite celebrity, to talk like our, our favorite legislator, or to act more like our friends and to adopt their values. And that's the sad thing about the Sanhedrin. They had seen Jesus with their own eyes. They recognized his spirit alive in these common men but they still would not listen. They still would not let the truth sink into their hearts. And instead, they opposed Peter and John. And instead of surrendering to the persecution, all of the believers together became even bolder. And that is the same power and the same Holy Spirit that indwells every follower of Christ today. It's, it is a power so strong that death could not hold Jesus in the grave. It, it, it is so strong that the, the devil and his demons could not overcome it. And that's why uh, you, they couldn't stop talking about it. Because Peter and John and the rest of the apostles had seen with their own eyes, they saw Jesus die on the cross. They saw him, his body limp. They were sad and scared. They grieved his death. They saw, and then they saw him alive again. And, the, and they couldn't stop telling everybody who would listen. They still had problems. Their neighbor was still rude and obnoxious. <laughs> the coworker was still lazy. The world was still a dark place. So many troubles. But Jesus was alive. And, and he is risen. And that one fact changes everything. Our lives can have meaning and purpose. The world, this world is not the end of the story. Uh, we have a hope that stretches beyond the grave. Eternal life is now inside of our souls. And everything we do, every move we make, sends ripples into eternity. And, and that's why 
the resurrection of Jesus is such a life-changing, transformative event. But far too often, we let the power sit dormant inside of our souls. Um, we need to understand that we have, we have been redeemed. We have been cleansed. We have been filled. And the past can be wiped away. Everything has changed because of Jesus. Um, the story I love to, one of my favorite stories that I love to tell <laughs> to explain uh, this is when I was little, I went with my dad to my grand, grandmother's house. Um, she lived a couple of blocks away from us. There was this giant hole in her backyard and there, were a bun there was a bunch of mud at the bottom of the hole. I didn't know where the hole came from and my dad was very upset about it. Uh, and he, wouldn't exp he wasn't explaining anything to me. Uh, but apparently, it looked like his shovel had fallen into the down to the bottom of the hole. And he was, uh, it was huge. It was like a crater. And he was trying to fish it out, you know, trying to find something to get it, get it back out. And he was going back, and we lived like two blocks from my grandmother. So he would go back and forth, and I would go with him. And one time, he left me there in the backyard. And I'm sitting there. I'm a, I'm a little kid. Right? And I'm thinking, well, I could take care of this. Uh, I'll jump in and save the shovel, and everything will be okay. So I jumped into the pit with both feet. <laughs> and I realized the mud at the bottom is a lot deeper than I thought. But I got the shovel, I threw it out, and then I couldn't get out. So I was, I was stuck there until my dad came back. And when he returned, I thought he would be happy, but he was not happy. <laughs> He was he was very mad, and uh, you know he's not a believer. He 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 he's just he's cursing like left and right as he pulled me out. He's telling he's cursing in Spanish, uh, which was his favorite thing to do. And and he's as he's getting me out, and I went over. He took me over to the water hose, and he just like sprayed, rinsed me off, sprayed me down. And he we got into the truck, and we went back home. And when we got home, he started explaining to my mom what had happened. <clears throat> and as I started making out the words, I realized that this wasn't just a hole. Uh, it was the place where something called a septic tank had been leaking, and the mud wasn't just mud. <laughs> it was sludge from the sewage that had spilled out from the leak from the septic tank. And listen, that is an image of how Jesus came down to earth he slept he stepped into the sludge of this world he jumped into the mud with both feet the creator of heaven and earth be stepped into it and he didn't come as a king or as a noble he didn't come as ruler or as a prince no jesus came all the way down and humbled himself just to rescue us to lift us up and to set our feet on higher ground so that we could be saved. Salvation is found in no other name. I love, uh, he, I, I, Isaiah 53, 5 uh, through 7 says, he was beaten so we could be whole. He was whipped so we could be healed. All of us like sheep have strayed away. We have left God's paths to follow our own, yet the Lord laid on him the sins of us all. He was oppressed and treated harshly, yet he never said a word. He was led like a, like a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep is silent before its shearers, he did not open his mouth. Listen, you are free to run your race without the burden of sin weighing you down. You can live in the power that you've been given by God. Resurrection power is alive now inside of your soul. You can overcome those hurts from the past. You can forgive and move forward. You can let go of the grudges. You can change your thinking. You can change your attitude. You can have a life filled with meaning and purpose. You can move from just surviving to thriving, even in this world that is mean and messy. Um, th there's, a, there's another story about a little girl who was walking in a garden. She noticed a very beautiful flower. 
She admired how lovely it looked and, and enjoyed its fragrance, and she studied it. As she studied it, her eyes followed the stem down to the soil, and she thought, being a little girl, uh, this flower is too pretty to be planted in such an ugly, uh, uh, such ugly dirt. And so she pulled the flower by its roots. She ran over to the water faucet and to wash away the soil. And it wasn't long until the flower wilted and died. And when the gardener passed by, he saw the little girl and what she'd done. He said, you have, you have destroyed my finest flower. And the little girl's reply was, oh, I'm sorry. I, I, I didn't like it being in that dirt. The dirt was ugly. And the gardener explained, I chose that spot and mixed the soil because I knew that only there could it grow to be the beautiful flower that it was. You need to know today that God has placed you exactly where you need to be. And he has no problem moving you to another spot when the time comes, but too often we, we rush ahead if, if the dirt looks ugly. We uproot ourselves prematurely when we don't want to wait on his timing. Listen, it doesn't matter where you are. God can help us thrive in the dirt. Uh, I've, I've met some wonderful people of God through the years. They, they seem so spiritually beautiful and refined. But if you hear their story, it often comes packaged with the dirt of pain. And they overcame. God helped them, not just to survive, but to thrive. Listen, the opposition, the problems, we're not talking about abuse or something like that, but what we're talking about is trials and opposition and problems that you face today are not intended to keep you down in defeat. No, they're there so that you can overcome them, so that you can rise up out of the ground in beauty. And if we believe that Jesus arose from the grave, we have to live like it. Uh, if we believe that the same power resides within us, then we have to show it. We have a hope that is eternal. Even the devil if, if, it is there so that we can overcome in victory. God could have wiped the devil out a long time ago, but he didn't. God left him there for now. We know that he's a defeated foe. We know how his end will come, that it will come in destruction to him, for him. But what God wants you to do is to dig your roots deeper into the soil, to grow, to mature, to be strengthened in your faith. And even if I may say the manure of life, the sludge, makes great fertilizer. Uh, but we have to depend on his word. Do what God is calling you to do. He wants to give you the strength to do what's right in your marriage. He wants to give you the wisdom in your work, in your relationships, in the problems that you have. He wants you to enjoy your life, uh, your ministry, your career, your education, to be the best that you can be. He wants to open the windows of heaven and to pour out such blessing upon you that you can't contain it. And so the question is, how long will you go before you, you stop resisting and start trusting? What is there in your heart that you, you don't want to let go of? Is it pride? Is it anger? Is it lust? Is it worry? Let it go. Repent. Feel the grief and give it to God. Repent of it. And if you've not done so already, open the door of your heart and let God cleanse you from the inside out. Don't just determine today to be a better person. That's not good enough. Don't just determine to try a little harder. That's not good enough to bring life to what is dead. Only Jesus can bring everlasting life. Surrender your soul to him. Trust him with your life. Jesus offers a fresh start. That's the only way to be born again. That's the only way to experience the same resurrection power that we've been talking about here today. Jesus died on the cross so that we could live Believe that he's the son of God. Trust him as Savior and Lord, and you will be saved. Let's go to God together in prayer. Father, we thank you that Jesus died for everyone in the world. 
But to receive your gift of eternal life, we have to accept it. I pray for those who are sensing a stirring inside of their souls. If, if that's you right now, no matter where you're listening, around the world, pray this prayer of commitment right, right there where you are, wherever you find yourself. You might pr pray with your heart a prayer of commitment to the Lord and say, Father, I know that I'm not perfect. I have sinned against you. And right now I ask you to forgive my sin. And I thank you for sending Jesus to die in my place. I trust him as my savior and my Lord. And I thank you for making me new. For it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen.